Before we dive into this intense and captivating true crime story, I want to take a moment to ask for your support. If you're enjoying these deep dives and want to help me continue growing and improving the content, make sure to hit that subscribe button and share this video with your friends. Your support really helps me bring you better content and keeps this channel going strong. Now, let's get into the chilling story of the Ariel Castro kidnappings. In the heart of Cleveland, Ohio, a seemingly ordinary neighborhood became the backdrop for one of the darkest secrets in modern crime history. For over a decade, three women vanished without a trace Michelle Knight in 2002, Amanda Berry in 23, and Gina DeGesis in 2004. Their disappearances seemed unrelated at first, but behind the doors of Ariel Castro's unassuming home, a living nightmare was taking place. These women weren't just missing, they were trapped in a real-life horror right under everyone's noses. The world would only learn the full scale of the horrors in May 2013, when Amanda Berry managed the impossible, breaking free with her young daughter in tow and screaming for help. What followed was a shocking revelation, one that Cleveland and the world would never forget. The question that haunted everyone, how did one man hide such evil in plain sight for so long? Michelle Knight was the first of Ariel Castro's victims, and her abduction in August 2002 marked the beginning of what would become over a decade of unimaginable horror. At the time, Michelle was 21 years old, navigating an incredibly difficult period in her life. She had recently lost custody of her young son, Joey, to the state and was on her way to a court hearing regarding his custody when she disappeared. Her abduction did not spark widespread media attention or a large police investigation. Authorities assumed that Michelle had simply run away due to the stress of her life circumstances, particularly losing custody of her child. This assumption severely limited the resources spent on searching for her, and her name was even removed from the National Crime Information Center database 15 months after her disappearing. The police's decision to categorize her as a runaway was partly due to her age. Michelle was an adult, and it was believed she had voluntarily left. This grave misjudgment allowed Ariel Castro to continue hiding her in plain sight, holding her captive in his Cleveland home with almost no public outcry for her return. In the years that followed, Michelle endured unimaginable physical and psychological torture. Castro kept her chained and isolated, often subjecting her to violent abuse. He forced her to miscarry several times through brutal beatings, robbing her of the chance to ever reunite with her son. During her captivity, Michelle found herself slipping into a forgotten world. She followed the news from a small television Castro eventually allowed her, but she never saw any mention of her case, which confirmed her worst fears no one was searching for her. Michelle Knight's story is one of both horror and resilience, and her experience was overshadowed by the false assumptions made early in the investigation. It would take more than a decade before she, along with Amanda Berry and Gina DeGesis, would finally escape. In April 2003, 16-year-old Amanda Berry was excited to celebrate her 17th birthday, but her life took a horrifying turn just the day before. After finishing her shift at a local Burger King, Amanda called her sister to let her know she was getting a ride home. That ride, however, was from Ariel Castro, a man Amanda knew only vaguely through his children, who had attended the same school as her. She accepted his offer, unsuspecting of the nightmare that awaited her. When Amanda didn't come home that night, her family was immediately alarmed. Her mother, Lawana Miller, was adamant that Amanda would never willingly disappear, especially not the day before her birthday. This instinct proved correct, but despite her family's persistence, law enforcement initially believed that Amanda, like Michelle Knight, had run away. The FBI's early assessment of her case suggested she might have left on her own despite her mother's protests. A chilling development came just a week after Amanda's disappearance when her mother received a phone call from an unidentified man. He claimed that Amanda was fine and would return home soon, but this would never happen. 
The call only deepened the mystery as it had been made from Amanda's own cell phone, indicating that she was in the hands of her captor, Ariel Castro. This sinister clue pushed investigators to take her case more seriously. Unlike Michelle Knight's disappearance, Amanda's case drew significant media attention. She was featured in segments on major programs such as America's Most Wanted, and her case became a focal point of the Cleveland community's efforts to find her. Tragically, while her family continued searching, Amanda remained locked away just a few miles from home, subjected to daily abuse and isolation. Her abduction garnered hope and attention for a time, but as the years passed and despite the initial public spotlight, the trail went cold. Amanda would remain hidden in Castro's house of horrors, silently enduring her captivity while the world outside slowly moved on. In April 2004, just a year after Amanda Berry's disappearance, 14-year-old Gina DeGesis became the third victim of Ariel Castro's horrifying abductions. Gina, a middle school student at the time, was walking home from school when she encountered Castro, who exploited the fact that she was friends with his daughter Arlene. On that fateful day, Gina and Arlene had planned a sleepover, but when Arlene's mother denied permission, the girls parted ways. Castro used this opportunity to offer Gina a ride home, a gesture she accepted without hesitation because she trusted him as the father of her friend. Once inside Castro's house, Gina was lured further into his trap under the pretense that he needed to retrieve money. It wasn't until it was too late that she realized she was in grave danger. She was taken into the same terrifying captivity as Michelle Knight and Amanda Berry, becoming the youngest of the three victims. For years, Gina's family had no idea that she was being held just a few miles from home. Castro even had the audacity to offer false support to Gina's family, attending vigils and taking missing person flyers, further deepening the psychological cruelty. Gina's disappearance sparked an intense community response. The fact that she was just 14 heightened public outcry, and her family remained vocal and persistent in their search for answers. Local residents rallied to support Gina's family, holding vigils and organizing searches. The DeGesis family's grief was compounded by the media coverage, which continuously spotlighted the case. Gina's abduction was also linked to Amanda Berry's, further increasing media attention and community involvement. Despite these efforts, like the other victims, Gina remained hidden in plain sight. The police, although heavily involved in her case, were unable to track her down, even though she was confined in Castro's house, not far from where she had been kidnapped. Year after year, her family held on to hope, never giving up on their belief that Gina would one day return home. Life inside Ariel Castro's house was a constant nightmare for Michelle Knight, Amanda Berry, and Gina DeGesis. The women were confined primarily in the dark, cold basement of the house at first, where they were kept chained, deprived of basic hygiene, and denied even the most essential forms of dignity. Castro provided buckets for them to use as toilets, which he rarely emptied, leaving the women to suffer in appalling filth. The conditions were beyond dehumanizing. For much of their captivity, the women were restrained, sometimes with chains bolted to walls or heavy objects, limiting their movement to only a few feet at times. Food was scarce, and they were frequently starved as a form of punishment or control. Castro would also use psychological torture, manipulating the women's emotions and playing cruel mind games. He would sometimes leave the doors unlocked, leading them to believe they had a chance to escape, only to punish them when they attempted it. The mental toll of these tactics left them living in a constant state of terror. Over time, Castro moved the women from the basement to upstairs rooms, but their situation hardly improved. The rooms were locked with small holes for Castro to slide food through. Michelle and Gina shared one room, while Amanda, who later gave birth to Castro's daughter, Jocelyn, was kept in another. 
Although Amanda's daughter brought some light into their lives, the women were forced to continue living under the oppressive conditions. Castro would even occasionally take the child outside, reinforcing the women's powerlessness as they remained imprisoned. Despite the terror, the women found ways to cope and survive, even forming small moments of connection, like watching television or talking when Castro was out of the house. These brief moments of humanity kept them going, but the constant threat of violence, punishment and rape hung over their heads every day for over a decade. Michelle Knight endured some of the most severe abuse during her captivity. From the very beginning, she became a particular target for Ariel Castro due to her defiance and rebellious nature. Castro's cruelty toward her was relentless, and she suffered not only repeated physical and sexual assaults, but also psychological torture designed to break her spirit. One of the most horrifying aspects of Michelle's ordeal was the repeated forced miscarriages. Over the years, Michelle became pregnant multiple times, but each time, Castro violently intervened to prevent her from carrying the pregnancies to term. He would starve her for days and beat her severely, particularly targeting her stomach, which caused her to miscarry at least five times. These brutal assaults left permanent physical damage, and Castro's vicious intent to control her even extended to denying her the chance to become a mother again. Michelle was often singled out for punishment more than the other women. Castro would withhold food from her as a form of control, frequently chaining her to a support beam in the basement, where she was left isolated and immobilized for extended periods. The constant beatings, coupled with his sadistic mind games, left her in a state of ongoing physical and mental torment. She later revealed that she was considered the rebellious one, and as a result, she bore the brunt of Castro's cruelty. Despite the unimaginable suffering, Michelle demonstrated an incredible will to survive. Her strength and resilience were tested beyond limits, but she managed to hold on, even assisting Amanda Berry during the birth of her daughter. Though she faced the harshest punishments, Michelle never let Castro completely break her spirit. Her story is a testament to survival against the odds, despite the brutality she faced. In December 2006, Amanda Berry gave birth to a daughter while still held captive by Ariel Castro. The pregnancy was a pivotal moment during the women's imprisonment, bringing a small glimmer of hope and light into their otherwise grim reality. Castro, while regularly violent and abusive, allowed Amanda to carry the pregnancy to term, although the circumstances surrounding the birth were deeply disturbing. The child, later named Jocelyn, was born inside Castro's house with no medical assistance. Michelle Knight, who had prior experience as a mother, was forced to help Amanda deliver the baby. The birth took place in a small inflatable pool as Castro wanted to avoid making a mess in the house. Amanda later described how the child's birth brought a rare moment of joy amidst the years of torment. Despite their horrific circumstances, the women worked together to protect Jocelyn and shield her from the harsh reality of their captivity. For Amanda, having a child provided a new sense of purpose and hope even as she remained trapped in Castro's twisted world. The women Amanda, Michelle, and Gina fiercely protected the little girl, making sure she remained as unaware as possible of the true horrors surrounding them. Castro, oddly, allowed Jocelyn more freedom than the women. At times, he would take her outside, which became a painful reminder to Amanda that while her daughter experienced glimpses of the outside world, she and the other women remained locked away. Jocelyn's presence became a source of strength for the women, helping them survive the darkest days. They created a sense of normalcy for the child, even pretending that she was going to school, when, in reality, she was simply pacing the same small rooms they were confined to. This fragile sense of hope carried the women through the years until their eventual escape in 2013. In 2006, amidst the horrors of their captivity, Amanda Berry became pregnant with Ariel Castro's child. This pregnancy and the eventual birth of her daughter, Jocelyn, became a bittersweet turning point for the women. While the conditions remained brutal, the child's arrival brought a small, fragile glimmer of hope into their grim reality. 
Amanda's pregnancy was an ordeal in itself. She was still chained, abused, and deprived of basic necessities during this time. When she went into labor, Castro forced her to give birth in a small inflatable kiddie pool to avoid making a mess. Michelle Knight, despite her own immense suffering, was made to assist in the delivery. The situation was dire, but against all odds, the baby was born healthy. Castro, who had often treated the women with complete disregard, allowed some minimal care for the newborn, though it was clear this was not out of kindness. For Amanda, Jocelyn became a source of light and purpose. She poured her energy into protecting her daughter from the harsh realities of their existence, trying to maintain as much normalcy as possible. Michelle and Gina, though enduring their own pain, also bonded with Jocelyn, and the women worked together to shield the child from the abuse they suffered. As Jocelyn grew, she became a symbol of resilience for the women. Amanda and the others did everything in their power to keep her from understanding the full extent of their captivity, pretending that the confined space they lived in was normal. Jocelyn even had a semblance of a routine, walking around the house as if going to school, unaware of the nightmare unfolding around her. For Amanda, her daughter was the motivation she needed to hold on and eventually plan for their escape. The investigations into the disappearances of Michelle Knight, Amanda Berry, and Gina De Gessis were marred by several critical failures, particularly in the case of Michelle Knight. When Michelle disappeared in August 22, law enforcement did not prioritize her case. Because she was an adult and had recently lost custody of her son, authorities assumed she had left voluntarily out of frustration. This assumption led to a severe lack of urgency and only minimal resources were devoted to finding her. In a deeply concerning oversight, Michelle's name was even removed from the National Crime Information Center database 15 months after her disappearance, further reducing any chances of her being located. Amanda Berry's case was handled with slightly more attention, but it too suffered from missteps. When Amanda disappeared the day before her 17th birthday in April 2003, the initial belief was that she had run away. Despite her mother's insistence that Amanda would never leave willingly, especially not before her birthday, law enforcement leaned toward this runaway theory, delaying more aggressive investigative efforts. The heartbreak for Amanda's family deepened when a psychic, Sylvia Brown, incorrectly told Amanda's mother during a public appearance that her daughter was dead. This false information devastated Lawana Miller, Amanda's mother, who began to lose hope. Tragically, she passed away in 2006, still believing that her daughter was never coming home. This false sense of closure slowed down public and private efforts to continue the search, even though Amanda was still alive and held captive just a few miles away. Gina DeGesse's case received considerable media attention due to her age and the proximity of her disappearance to Amanda Berry's. Despite the public outcry and her family's tireless efforts, Gina's abduction also fell victim to investigative shortcomings, with authorities failing to connect the disappearances earlier, despite several clues indicating a possible link. The collective failure to respond to these cases with the necessary urgency allowed Ariel Castro to continue his reign of terror for over a decade. In May 2013, after more than a decade of captivity, Amanda Berry saw her opportunity to escape. When Ariel Castro made a critical mistake, he forgot to lock the inside door of his house. Though the storm door was still padlocked, Amanda seized the moment. Hearing her daughter, Jocelyn, playing downstairs unsupervised, Amanda knew that Castro had left the house. She made a split-second decision to try and escape, despite the risks. Amanda managed to open the wooden front door enough to stick her arm through the gap. She waved frantically and screamed for help, her heart racing with the possibility that Castro might return at any moment. Her cries for help were heard by a neighbor, Charles Ramsey, who was eating inside his home nearby. Ramsey ran to her aid, and with the help of another neighbor, Angel Cordero, they began kicking the storm door until they broke through. Amanda and her daughter crawled out, finally free after ten long years. 
Once outside, Amanda borrowed Ramsey's phone and made a frantic call to 911. The emotion in her voice was palpable as she identified herself. Help me, I'm Amanda Berry. I've been kidnapped and I've been missing for 10 years. And I'm here. I'm free now. Her desperate plea alerted police, who responded immediately. When they arrived at Castro's house, they discovered the unimaginable Michelle Knight and Gina DeGesis were still inside, locked in separate rooms. The women were finally rescued, bringing an end to their decade-long nightmare. This escape, fueled by Amanda's courage and quick thinking, was a moment of triumph and shock for the entire world. The women's rescue shattered the quiet facade of Ariel Castro's house and exposed the horrifying reality that had been hidden for so long. On the very same day that Amanda Berry escaped and the three women were rescued, Ariel Castro was arrested, marking the beginning of a legal process that would shock the world. The police apprehended Castro as he returned to his house, unaware that his victims had already gained their freedom. The media coverage that followed was massive and immediate, as the unimaginable story of three women being held captive for over a decade dominated headlines across the globe. In the days after his arrest, Castro faced over 900 criminal charges, reflecting the horrifying scope of his crimes. These included kidnapping, rape, and aggravated murder charges related to the forced miscarriages Michelle Knight suffered as a result of Castro's violent assaults. His total charges also included hundreds of counts of gross sexual imposition, felonious assault, and possession of criminal tools. The grand jury indictment covered only part of the time the women were held, stretching from 2002 to 2007, though their ordeal lasted until 2013. During the legal proceedings, Castro initially pleaded not guilty, but it quickly became clear that the evidence against him was overwhelming. The prosecution gathered testimony from the women, DNA evidence linking him to Amanda Berry's daughter, and a comprehensive list of charges, leaving no room for doubt. In July 2013, Castro accepted a plea deal to avoid the death penalty, pleading guilty to over 900 counts. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole, plus 1,000 years a sentence meant to ensure he would never see freedom again. The media storm surrounding the case was relentless, with the world captivated by the sheer horror of what had been happening behind closed doors in a seemingly ordinary Cleveland neighborhood. Reporters swarmed the area, documenting every detail of the trial, the charges, and the survivors' stories as the public grappled with the enormity of Castro's crimes. In August 2013, Ariel Castro faced the full weight of justice for his decade-long crimes. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus an additional 1,000 years, ensuring he would never walk free again. This sentence came after Castro pleaded guilty to over 900 counts, including kidnapping, rape, and aggravated murder. His admission of guilt spared him from the death penalty, but left no doubt that he would spend the rest of his life behind bars. However, just a month into his sentence, on September 3, 2013, Castro was found dead in his prison cell, having hanged himself with a bedsheet. His suicide, which occurred so shortly after his sentencing, left many people feeling an unsettling lack of closure. For the survivors and their families, Castro's death denied them the chance to see him serve the full extent of his punishment. It also ignited public debate about whether his suicide was an escape from the consequences of his actions or a final act of cowardice. While Castro's death ended his personal involvement in the case, the impact of his crimes remained. The public and the survivors were left to grapple with the aftermath, as Castro's suicide marked a sudden and unexpected end to one of the most horrifying chapters in Cleveland's history. After their rescue in May 2013, Michelle Knight, Amanda Berry, and Gina DeGesis embarked on long and difficult journeys of recovery, working to rebuild their lives after enduring more than a decade of captivity. Each woman faced unique challenges as they re-entered a world that had moved on without them, but they also found strength in sharing their stories and reclaiming their identities. 
Michelle Knight, who had suffered some of the most brutal abuse at the hands of Ariel Castro, took a particularly courageous approach to her recovery. In 2014, just one year after their escape, she published her memoir, Finding Me, A Decade of Darkness, A Life Reclaimed. In her book, Knight emphasizes her transformation from victim to survivor, detailing her harrowing experiences while also focusing on her resilience and determination to move forward. Michelle has been especially vocal about her desire to be seen as a victor, not a victim, and has used her platform to inspire others facing trauma. Amanda Berry and Gina DeJesses also shared their experiences through their co-authored memoir, Hope, a memoir of survival in Cleveland, which was published in 2015. Their book offers an intimate account of their years in captivity, shedding light on the moments of hope and humanity that sustained them during the darkest times. Amanda, who gave birth to her daughter Jocelyn while still captive, found her strength in motherhood, and she has since become an advocate for missing persons, working to help others who are still lost. Gina DeJesus, while more private about her experiences, has worked closely with her family to establish the Cleveland Family Center for Missing Children and Adults, continuing the fight for those who are missing, just as her own family did for so many years. Despite the unimaginable trauma they endured, the women have shown remarkable resilience in rebuilding their lives and using their stories to help others. Their recovery continues, but their courage and survival remain a powerful testament to human strength and perseverance. The discovery of Ariel Castro's horrific crimes sent shockwaves through Cleveland and beyond, forever changing the way the community viewed itself. For more than a decade, Castro's house sat inconspicuously in a working-class neighborhood, masking the unspeakable acts of violence and control happening within. The revelation that three women had been held captive in the heart of the city stunned locals, who had no idea that such horrors were unfolding just steps away from their daily lives. The initial shock quickly turned into outrage. Neighbors and the broader Cleveland community grappled with the fact that Castro had successfully hidden his crimes for over a decade in plain sight. Many residents expressed guilt and frustration, wondering how such a tragedy could have gone unnoticed for so long. The case highlighted flaws in the system, particularly the shortcomings in law enforcement and public vigilance, as Michelle Knight had been largely forgotten due to the assumption that she had run away. On a larger scale, the case attracted massive media attention, not just in the United States, but across the globe. News outlets were flooded with stories of the women's survival, the details of their captivity, and Castro's eventual arrest. The sheer length of their confinement and the fact that it occurred in a densely populated city shocked the wider world, leading to discussions about the handling of missing persons cases and the responsibilities of communities in identifying signs of abuse. Cleveland itself became a focal point for debates about urban crime, community awareness, and how to better protect vulnerable populations. The house where the women were held was eventually demolished, in part to erase the dark symbol it had become, and to help the survivors and the community move forward. The case left a lasting impact not only on those directly involved, but also on the global understanding of captivity and survival.